I want to say, first of all, thank you so much to our partners on making this program tonight possible. So I'm going to hand it off to one of our partners. Um, <clears throat> she's the president of the Wheaton League of Women Voters. So I'm going to hand it over to Judy. Thank you, Courtney. The League of Women Voters is proud to be a partner to present this important panel discussion. So thank you. Um, our League chapter serves the communities of Carroll Stream, Warrenville, West Chicago, Wheaton, and Winfield. Um, the League of Women Voters is a strictly nonpartisan political organization that never supports or opposes any candidates or political party. And just lastly, our Wheaton League founder and Wheaton City Councilwoman, Margaret Hamilton, who later became the first female Wheaton mayor, supported the open housing ordinance in Wheaton in 1966. So I will pass it along to Patrick Watson. Hello and thank you. We are, are happy to be here. We are the DuPage County NAACP. My name is Patrick Watson. I'm the political action chair. We're so happy that you were able to put together this, this fantastic panel. We want to thank all of the panelists for joining and for talking just about this historic moment. The DuPage County NAACP is one of the oldest civil rights groups in DuPage County. The NAACP as a whole is the oldest civil rights organization in America. We've been been around our branch for 64 years. We've been around since 1956. And our objectives are to ensure the political, educational, social, economic, and equal justice for all citizens. We do a number of different initiatives, such as voter registration, voter education, housing. We have an AXO program, which is a Junior Olympics of the Mind, criminal justice reform, and a number of other issues that we're focused on. So we're very happy to be a part of this panel, and we're very interested in just hearing from the panel tonight. Great. And hi, everyone. I'm Rachel Bautista. And on behalf of the Community Relations Commission, I want to thank you all for joining us tonight. For those of you who are not familiar with the Community Relations Commission, we are a group of local volunteers. And our purpose is to be a catalyst in the community to connect all people and make them feel united with Wheaton through events, key partnerships and opportunities to give back. You can visit the Community Relations Commission page found on the City of Wheaton website. I'll be sure to leave a link in the chat for more information, including information of our events and programs and information that we have compiled in recognition of Hispanic and Latinx Heritage Month. Uh, we are proud to co-sponsor tonight's event with the Wheaton Public Library, the DuPage NAACP, the League of Women Voters of Wheaton, and the DuPage County Historical Museum on this important event that happened right here in Wheaton. And as we discussed sharing this part of Wheaton history with the broader community, we wanted to not only tell the history, but to tell it through the lived experiences and to shed light on some of the individuals like Nathaniel Odom and Claude Audley, who were instrumental in the fight for fair housing in Wheaton, but to also passing fair housing in Wheaton. And we hope we all walk away with a bit of understanding and what we can all do to continue to drive change in our communities. And I would love to give a special thank you to our panelists for being here tonight to help us tell this important part of history, but also for their willingness to share their personal experiences. And tonight we are joined by four incredible panelists. Um, we are joined by Ray Odom. And for background, Ray is the oldest of 10 children of Nathaniel and Zadie Odom. And for those of you who may not know, the Odom family have been in Wheaton and DuPage County since the early 1950s and have been instrumental to helping make Wheaton and the DuPage community what it is today, um, as well as being integral to the fight for fair housing um, in Wheaton and DuPage and the broader DuPage County. After graduating Glenbard West High School, Ray went on to the, attend Valparaiso University and he holds a JD from Ohio State University and currently works as a senior vice president at a large banking institution. Ray has always been involved in the community since his work as a standing leader and member of the NAACP youth group in junior high um, in junior high and high school. He's an, he's an ordained youth pastor and a standing member of the Second Baptist Church and Victory Cathedral in Bolingbrook. He served six years on the DuPage Housing Authority and one of those years he was president. So he's very familiar with affordable housing challenges in DuPage County. He's also a father of seven, most of whom have attended Wheaton schools and he and his wife continue to live in DuPage County. So thank you, Ray, again for joining us. We are also joined by Claude Audley Jr. He is the oldest of two children of Claude and Thelma Audley, who are also um, who have also lived in Wheaton for 50 plus years. 
as you're about to learn as well, they were also the Audley family who has also been instrumental to helping make Wheaton um, and DuPage County what it is today, as well as integral to the fight for fair housing um, in Wheaton and DuPage County. After attending Wheaton Central High School, he went on to graduate from Northern Illinois University and currently works as a real estate appraiser and consultant of his own firm, Audley & Associates. He's also very familiar with the housing industry through his prior work as a city planner and former assistant city manager and his work as a real estate consultant and investor. And he and his wife currently live in Cincinnati, Ohio. So thank you again, Claude, for joining us tonight. Um, and we are also joined by Bernie Kleina. Bernie Kleiner was the former executive director of Hope Housing in Wheaton during a critical period of fair housing and the civil rights movement. He's contributed his entire life to advancing fair housing across the country and has used his photographic skills to increase public awareness about the history of the fair housing movement and to help people and better understand the pernicious harm that housing discrimination inflicts on individuals, families, and communities. His photos of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and the 1965 open housing marches in Chicago and through his photos of murals and other collections have been displayed in venues across the country. So Bernie, thank you again for joining us uh, tonight. Thank you. And lastly, we are joined by Zach Bishop. Zach Bishop has been the curator of the DuPage County Historical Museum for three years. He has a master's degree in history from Northern Illinois University and previously worked as a curator of the Downers Grove Museum. He regularly researches the history of the Midwest. Thank you again, Zach, for joining us. Thank you. All right, so before we get into discussion, we all felt it's really important for everyone to have the historical context and specifically really understanding the housing discrimination that was happening, since that's really central to this discussion as well as to this march and this fight. So I'm gonna turn it over to Zach Bishop to help give a little bit of that context. So Zach, if you can uh, please kick us off with the, with the historical context. Thank you, Rachel. Um all right, so um, I'm going to be giving a brief historical overview of the 1966 Civil Rights March in Wheaton um, and kind of going into a little bit about the background of what was going on. Um, so basically the march was, um, the Wheaton marchers wanted Wheaton to pass a fair housing ordinance, which was intended to combat housing discrimination, which was prevalent in DuPage County and Wheaton at the time and really this was happening all across the Northern United States. So um, housing discrimination, it really seems to have begun in the early 20th century in DuPage County. Um, and really what started to happen was DuPage County residents began to intentionally prevent people of color from purchasing homes and property in the county. And they used a lot of methods that were common across the United States. Um, one a big one was a restrictive covenants in property deeds. And so this is where either a homeowner or a real estate developer, when they sold a property, they included a clause in there that said that the house could not be sold to a person of color. Um, other big ways were um, real estate agents and mortgage brokers. Real estate agents would often refuse to show houses to people of color. Mortgage brokers would refuse to give mortgages. That was a big thing that was happening. Um, and then there were some other ones as well. So um, neighborhood organizing. So certain neighborhoods in DuPage County, especially um, neighborhood associations would often work together to try to like put restrictive covenants and housing deeds and otherwise police who was moving into their community. Um, there were intimidation and threats that would happen when people of color moved into the community and their neighbors did not want them to move in. And then there were other, um, other ways, so there was employment discrimination in DuPage County, so it was hard for people of color to find jobs. Um, and often a lot of the people that did move into du people of color who did move into DuPage County ended up commuting into the city uh, for their work. And then another one was um, businesses in the county refusing to um, do business or serve people of color. Um, this is especially the case with like restaurants and hotels. Um, so all of these methods were going on and really um, you can kind of really see, so as DuPage County was growing in the 20th century, it was not growing equally. Um, so for in 1900, uh, black people made up 0.6% uh, of the population. And as DuPage County's population doubled and tripled and continued to grow, 
um, the percentage of black people living in the county was actually decreasing. So there was these efforts were working the way that um, the people in the county wanted it to, um, unfortunately. And so really the one of the only places that pe people of color could purchase homes in DuPage County was in uh, the Hill and Bottom neighborhoods on the east side of Wheaton. Uh, so this graphic here kind of shows where these two neighborhoods were located. Um, the, um, kind of between Washington streets, um, between uh, Washington Street and Lorraine Road, um, and then from Roosevelt Road up to College Avenue. And so this, and really a lot of the people of color who did um, end up living in this neighborhood also had to purchase the property and build the homes themselves um, in order to live in the county. And then um, after 1945, uh, the York Center Co-op was formed um, kind of near the Lombard area and they also um, allowed um, people of color to live in their neighborhood, but that was a cooperative community, meaning they didn't own the houses, it was owned by the cooperative organization. So it was kind of different than having your own property. Uh, so then there was the march that came along. So the march, that occurred in Wheaton that we're talking about tonight um, occurred in September 24th, 1966. It started at 12.30 p.m. It was organized by the DuPage County NAACP chapter and um, particularly the two organizers um, who oversaw it were Claude Audley, who was the chapter president, and uh, Sidney Finley, who lived in Wheaton, um, but he was also the NAACP um, Midwest Regional Director. And so in about 1964, the DuPage NAACP chapter started lobbying the Wheaton City Council to pass a fair housing ordinance. And so really the march was kind of the culmination of those efforts. And another thing that's important to mention that was going on um, during this time was that Martin Luther King had started his uh, Chicago Freedom Movement uh, where he was um, organizing and drawing awareness to the ways that um, racism and discrimination happened in the Northern United States, which is a lot more subtle than what was happening in the Southern United States. And so really his um, Chicago Free Movement was mostly happening in Chicago with marches and other demonstrations. And so kind of the timeline um, of the march. So. The Tuesday before the march on September 20th, uh, the DuPage NAACP chapter presented a fair housing ordinance to the Wheaton City Council. And the Wheaton City Council um, agreed to consider it, uh, but the marchers wanted, or but the NAACP also wanted to really show the city that they meant business, that they were really serious about this. And so they organized the march. Uh, they received a permit from the city of Wheaton on the Thursday before September 23rd. And on the day of the march, about 140 people participated in the march, um, both black and white. It, uh, the group was made up of DuPage residents, um, but also students from Wheaton College and the Mary Knoll Seminary, which used to be in Glen Ellen. Um, they participated in the march and um, also members of other NAACP chapters in the Chicagoland area. And there was also a group um, from the NAACP chapter in Milwaukee as well that um, joined. And um, there was a big police presence at the march. Um, the city of Wheaton um, received, the city of Wheaton Police Department received help from the DuPage Sheriff's Office and as well as the state of Illinois. And as, according to reports, they lined the route um, with the stated purpose of wanting to avoid any um, incidences of violence or other confrontations. And so, um, this um, is kind of just an outline of the march in the route that they took. Uh, so they started over um, at the home of Claude Audley on Hill Street, and they went east onto Hill Street, uh, turned onto Crescent Street, took that down to Washington Avenue where they turned north, and then they turned um, west on they turned west onto Wesley Street and went down to City Hall. And at City Hall, um, they um, met with. Um, city leaders, I'll talk more about that in a moment. But then after they met at City Hall, they went down um, Wheaton Avenue, turned uh, east onto Front Street and went all the way down back to Washington Avenue where they disbanded. 
And so at City Hall uh, during their stop, um, NAACP leaders gave um, speeches in support of, an of the open housing ordinance. And they also, um, uh, there was pray praying as well. And uh, uh, the city of Wheaton leaders who met the group there were uh, Mayor Carl Hempke at the time, uh, Councilwoman uh, Margaret Hamilton, or Margaret Hamilton, who uh, would later become Wheaton's first female mayor. And then also city manager Robo, uh, Robert Epley as well. And so all three of the representatives uh, promised uh, that they would work to figure out a solution to housing discrimination in Wheaton. Uh, Margaret Hamilton was the only one who specifically um, expressed support for the ordinance. Um, and so it would take a little bit more convincing of the other city council members um, to get the ordinance passed. So this is, um, so these are screenshots of some articles that were published about the march in local newspapers at the time. Uh, the two on the left here are the ones that appeared in the Wheaton Daily Journal. And there surprisingly wasn't a lot of coverage in that. Um, there was an article before the march uh, when uh, they got the permit for it. And then there was an article afterwards. Um, the Chicago Tribune also covered it. Uh, you could see their um, article on the right over here. Um, and so um, they had coverage as well. And I believe other Chicago newspapers covered it as well, um, but these are the only ones I was able to find um, uh, through online and through other resources. And so the city of Wheaton did not an approve the initial fair housing ordinance that the NAACP proposed. The reason they gave was that the city attorney said that the law wasn't legally enforceable. Uh, but um, so, the DuPage NAACP, the DuPage NAACP, uh, Margaret Hamilton, the Wheaton Human Relations Councils, and other advocates continued to push for an ordinance. Uh, starting in um, March of 1967, uh, Wheaton, Winfield, and Glen Ellen, um, their human relations councils and groups, uh, started uh, what was called the Central DuPage Program for Better Living, which was a voluntary fair housing program that they started where they um, met with realtors in the area and tried to get them to um, prom or promise not to accept discriminatory listings um, in their services. Um, and by July 1967, they said about 66% of local realtors had agreed to it. And so um, it was about uh, on July 3rd, the eve of uh, 4th of July, uh, the Wheaton City Council finally approved um, a fair housing ordinance. Um, it passed by a pretty wide margin. Four voted for the um, ordinance, including uh, Mayor Carl Hemke, um, and as well as council members, uh, Margaret Hamilton, Elmer Johnson, and John Waters. Uh, the only council member who voted uh, against the bill was uh, Wallace Conley. Uh, so Wheaton's ordinance prohibited housing discrimination based on uh, religion, race, color, or national origin. And um, the ordinance applied to real estate brokers, uh, realtors, and as well as uh, property owners themselves. And uh, so um, basically how the ordinance worked was that if someone had a complaint that they had been treated unfairly um, in, how, in the sale of a house, uh, they could submit a complaint to the Wheaton Human Relations Council. The council would then try to mediate the situation. Um, if they could not, they would hold a hearing and um, then eventually uh, pass along the results of the hearing to the Wheaton City Council, who would then vote uh, whether or not to give a fine of between $100 and $500. Um, or for the real estate uh, brokers, they could uh, rescind the real estate uh, broker's license to do to sell homes in Wheaton. Uh, Wheaton was the first major DuPage County municipality that passed a fair housing ordinance. Um, they were beat by a couple of months by the village of Weston, which was uh, a community in Western, uh, west of Winfield um, that actually was dissolved when Fermilab was built. And so they passed a uh, fair housing ordinance um, after they were chosen as the site of Fermilab because of um, national concerns about the United States um, putting a national lab in Illinois, which didn't have a statewide fair housing law. 
Um, and then several other Chicago suburbs adopted fair housing ordinances after Wheaton, and a lot actually used Wheaton's um, ordinance as a template for their own. Um, and then in um, 1968, um, there was the Fair Housing Act uh, passed uh, federally, and that um, prohibited uh, that prohibited the sale, rental, and financing of housing based on race, religion, national origin, and sex. And so that was um, a big moment, but of course, um, that was not the end to um, unfair housing practices in DuPage, um, and our panelists will be able to share a little bit more, uh, especially uh, Bernie Kleina. Um, so yeah, I will pass it along um, to you, Rachel, for, and the panelists. Great, thank you so much, Zach, for, for sharing that uh, important part of context to understand the situation. Um, so, so getting into the discussion, one of the things I, I would like to first do is, you know, through, through this historical context, we hear a lot about the role that Claude Audley and, and like a lot of the residents had played in that. And I, and I know Ray, your father was also instrumental in this fight. So uh, Claude and Ray would just love for you, if both of you could each just give a little bit of context on and who your fathers were and, and really understanding, you know, who their role was in their community um, and really understanding kind of their motivations and efforts in terms of um, really, you know, moving forward with this fight and more importantly, the, the work that they've done in, in passing fair um, housing ordinance in, in Wheaton. And, and Ray, if, if you wouldn't mind kicking things off. All right, very good. Well, uh, my dad uh, was born in Old Mogi, Oklahoma, and, and he was born just, uh, you know, so he would have been about, uh, about four or five when the, uh, when the Tulsa riots occurred. And uh, he uh, was uh, born into a family, I think they had five or six kids. He was uh, in the middle with a twin, who, uh, Nathan, who um, was the first one in the great migration from the Odom family to come up to the Chicago area. But before that, my dad had uh, uh, stopped schooling around uh, sometime around what would be our junior high age, and uh, eventually uh, wound up going to World War II and went to the D-Day invasion uh, just about a day or two after the actual invasion happened. And the reason was because he had been in England and the troops uh, that were in England were you know, mustering to, to go uh, to the invasion and a white MP killed a black soldier uh, in England for being on a, a, a toilet marked white only. And so uh, the commander actually, the people in charge said, well, we gotta ship these guys out because we were anticipating this is potentially gonna cause a riot. So they did ship out early and that's actually why they were in a position to actually be among the fighting units, even though uh, you know they didn't want black folks to be any heroes. Uh, so they, it kind of came behind that, but the reality was, is that he was in Germany and uh, was uh, the thing I always remember him telling me about was the fact that he, uh, their unit had to be actually in German occupied territory because the ultimate white commanding officer for their unit did not want anyone to know that he had black soldiers under him. And I say that story because coming back to the States then, um, my dad would tell me about VE Day. And he, and this is a story that really characterized the love that my dad had for people and his ability to kind of forgive and, and move on, but yet to remember. And that was, is that uh, there was a victory in Europe day that involved the uh, first, the, the uh, white officers, the white soldiers, and here's the key. Next, at the big banquet in London, there was, yes, the German prisoners ate after the German prisoners ate, then the black soldiers ate. Well, when my dad told me that story, I said, that's just not true. I remember he, he told me a couple of times, he said, yeah, they was, and he'd always use, it was kind of dirty, Ray. Yeah, it was dirty, you know, just dirty. And I said, well, dad, I'm sure that's just not true. And I didn't believe it until well, sometime years, years later, uh, decades later, they had a march in Chicago celebrating all the people who were in various wars to try to get the Vietnam people kind of celebrated. And yes, the Tuskegee Institute wrote an article in the newspaper and said about how they had ate after the German prisoners. Well, the point of that quick little update there wasn't so quick, but the fact was my dad learned the trades in the service. And through those, 
he and my mom met and got married. Now, one thing I should tell you about my dad, anybody who knew him would know this automatically. My dad was a Jesus man. He loved Jesus morning, noon, and night. We talked about Jesus when we got up, we went to bed, and he was a churchman too. And uh, he just, I mean, uh, my dad, you know, I, I would say he didn't cuss, drink, or smoke, or, or drink, smoke, or, 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 or chew, or run with those who do, but he did smoke. But the reality was, is that um, he really was someone who just absolutely never, I mean, he, he just didn't curse. He didn't do any of that kind of stuff. He was, a, he was just a gentle person. Well, the point was, is that he learned his trades. He built a house for my mom in, in Oklahoma. And uh, when he moved up here, his testimony to me was he had seen the Klan. He had seen lots of uh, harassment. That's why he came up for job opportunities. But the interesting thing was, is that he said that he had never seen the level of intensity of discrimination and exclusion that he found here. And one of the things I always said is, you know, the South, you know, they sort of didn't like, they hated the race, but they kind of loved the individual people. But in the North, they loved the race, but they hated the people and they didn't want the people around. Them. And that's what my, I think my dad found out is that, you know, you could, you could, you could, uh, you could be uppity, but you couldn't get close. Uh, where in the South, you could get close, but you couldn't be uppity. And the reality was, is that caused him to have significant problems as a builder. So when he uh, got some property through uh, tax deeds and some things and started building, um, he had tremendous problems getting mail delivered to the house and getting mail delivered to black homes they built because the streets were not properly uh, curbed and, and everything so that they could go down these gravel streets. and So it was really out of necessity, he began to say, hey, we got to do something about this. But what was the trigger for him was he was involved with the youth and he went to the uh, rolling rink out on North Avenue and they literally had, uh, they said, oh, we don't allow black kids to come in in this roller rink. And that was something he hadn't even <laughs> had down south. So he then formed the NAACP in, in uh, I guess it was 56 or so behind the Second Baptist Church and was his first member, a first leader. And really this whole housing thing was absolutely essential to him because um, literally um, he couldn't operate as a builder and he couldn't really do the things that he needed to do. And he just felt that that was tremendously unfair. And so uh, he had often coalesced with others to try to see if there wasn't a way to do things. And uh, that was his involvement. My mom was right with him. And uh, they formed, uh, uh, by the time the march occurs, I'll catch up with, uh, they had formed an auxiliary and, and other things. But that's my dad. Great, thank you for that. Um, and Claude, would you please share um, a little bit more <clears throat> history about your father? I think um, it's, it's kind of interesting that Ray talked about, sorry, <laughs> um, that Ray talked about uh, uh, World War II because my father had the same experiences, similar experience of the racism, outright racism that occurred in World War II uh, to the point where, uh, because they were, he was uppity, they decided to send him back to the beaches with no training to get to take out landmines with no training and no equipment. And the only reason that he survived was because when Germany started capitulating, they had so many prisoners of war. My father was one of the few people who had uh, who, who draw blueprints. And has technology. He went to all corner of AMM, so he had he had technology in terms of surveying and blueprinting. So that saved his life because he was scared to death on the beach with all those landmines. So he, they took him out to to design these stockades for the German prisoners. When he came back out of the war, he, would li he lived in Mississippi. He decided to come to Chicago because the great migration was there. But the same problem you had in Wheaton, you had in, oh, there was only certain places that you could live, which one was the west side of Chicago, and to some limited degree, the south side. The south side was not like it is now. 
So we he did buy property and it's because he was an entrepreneur in that sense. But what happened was because it was so constricted and you had so many Blacks or African-Americans moving in Chicago, they'd all, they were breaking down existing apartments into tenements where families of, you know, corner building that was designed for maybe 10 or 12 families, you may have had 75 to 100 people living there. Now we lived on a two family and which he owned, but he decided this was unacceptable. And so he looked for a place for his family to find property. He started researching and he looked at the Wheaton area for two reasons. One was because they had good schools and two, the transportation. They had the, my mother worked as a teacher and he was a lower level manager at the Love Check Springs. So they could either get on the road, that you had the expressway, uh, Roosevelt Road, or get on the train and get to work. But when he came to Wheaton, he wanted to build. And just like uh, Mr. Odom uh, had the same experience, he went all around Wheaton because it was at that time there was plenty of vacant land and he was either denied or told he couldn't have it or he was blackballed from real estate agents. Subsequently, he did find a lot. I think he really bought it from uh, the Harris's, a, a, a small lot where he had one of, not Mr. Oldham, but another African-American builder because he couldn't get anybody else to build a top to Mr. Richardson, if you remember him, all right, uh, to build our house in Wheaton. But he was always very upset about the fact that that was the only choice he had and he was not gonna let it go. He was a civil rights activist in Chicago. He was, one of the, he was like, the, the, the regular Democrats as opposed to daily Democrats. And it was a big mess with that. So when he came out to Wheaton, after a year or two of once he got himself established in his house, he got involved with the NAACP. That's when I met Mr. Odom um, as the president and became involved. And I think he was like the second or third president after uh, uh, Mr. Odom. <clears throat> he decided that the only way to do it was through activism. And along with uh, another gentleman that's very important, was, which was Sid Finley, who was, a who was a regional director of the NAACP, who happened to also live in that same, he, I guess, according to that map that Zachary had, he lived in the, we just call it one area, but he, I guess he lived in the bottom where we lived on the hill, on the Hill Avenue. And but Sid Finley and him decided working on uh, going through this illegal means of, of petitioning to the council to start a fair housing ordinance. Um, the only things I could tell you is that this, this started about 64, 65 when they started working on this, you know, and it wasn't just, it was the whole double NAACP at that time, they just happened to be the. Uh, my father, Mr. Finley, and a few others were the leaders in that in that whole initiative. And my father, being kind of a aggressive, could be abrasive at times, <laughs> was the best person because <laughs> he could be very blunt too. And so uh, he's the one to start when he get off work, took work off the petition to council, and it which really led to the point of. Uh, uh, the march. The only thing I he would, only other thing I can remember, I was a teenager at that time. What I can tell you about the, the march is prior to that, that one, well, I like to know, one is that the, he said the, his, he made a point of lobbying Mrs. Hamilton, Margaret Hamilton, because she was amenable to this whole fair housing and she did, and so he worked with her to help her to get the other members of council to pass the ordinance. That's number one. Number two is that it was decided that it was at that time that you had to show uh, that just negotiation by having some by having some public display was necessary if there was going to be action made. And that's what I can tell you about that. Um, uh, so that's where his role was. His proudest, his proudest moment was not so much the passing of 
the Wheaton ordinance as much as that he would always tell me that his proudest moment was that the ordinance was used as a template for passing of uh, these local civil rights, uh, local fair housing ordinance throughout the suburbs of, of Chicago. And that was the template they used because it was successful in Wheaton first. And they used that template because it also had gone through all the legal challenges, you know, that uh, they were saying that uh, Zach alluded to. So that that was what his proudest moment was with that. It did not end, uh, at, at 67 did not end uh, the whole issue of activism because you have to understand, uh, I, I forgot the gentleman's name who's now the president, but like you said, it's more comprehensive in terms of, you know, there was employment issues, you know, the lack of employment, there was, a, there, there was education issues, and so they all tie in with housing. And if you don't address all three of them, you can say, you, you can't, and I'm sure that's a problem with Wheaton, uh, DuPage County now with the high prices of property. If you don't have jobs and also the education, it's gonna be hard to continue with uh, accessing the housing in DuPage County, you know? And that's all I have at this point. And then, uh, thank you. Great. Oh, well, thank you for for sharing that. Um, you know, really, it's really important to hear and understand kind of the, the perspective yes. <laughs> yeah. of uh, of what brought your fathers there and, and the background for them, as well as their their work in the community and how what the situation was, how that really prevented them, and and had that being the key driver, obviously for um, for their efforts and their work through this. So, thank you again for for sharing that. Um, Bernie, would love to that also if you can, because you were so been so involved in um, both, you know, in, in Wheaton as well as a broader, you know, Chicago land area, you know, for the right for fair housing and, and civil rights. Um, would love to hear a little bit from you with regards to, you know, Hope Housing, their role in Wheaton in terms of the, the fight. I know they they weren't necessarily maybe involved in the march as much, but even just as we got to the ordinance and then, you know, your perspectives on just, you know, the civil rights movement in general, because obviously this was happening and you were involved in a, a lot of the efforts outside of Wheaton. First, I am so appreciative of Claude and, and Ray reminding everyone of the past, uh, the past uh, which involves so much uh, discrimination in every aspect of life and uh, and also the uh, the courage that uh, people faced in uh, overcoming discrimination and hate and uh, I'm so grateful for the stories that uh, they told us uh, today um, before I get into some of the discrimination issues uh, and unfortunately, they're still with us today. Um, you, you know, we're talking about the march in, in Wheaton and in July uh, uh, 10, uh, 1966, uh, Dr. King spoke in uh, Soldier Field. And uh, uh, it, it's kind of interesting, he said, we assemble here today to march to City Hall to demand redress of our legitimate grievances. I'm still convinced that there is nothing more powerful to dramatize and expo expose a social evil than the tramp, tramp, tramp of marching feet. And I think uh, this is part of the inspiration that led to marches in Wheaton and Elmhurst and, uh, and really um, uh, all over the country. Uh, Dr. King came to uh, Chicago to uh, uh, focus the attention of the nation on open housing, uh, which we now call fair housing. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of ironic that when people think of the uh, a civil rights movement. They think of uh, uh, freedom rides and voting rights and uh, uh, integrating lunch counters, movie theaters, and so on. But few remember or realize that uh, uh, a big issue in the civil rights movement 
uh, was uh, fair housing. And, um, and, and in fact, to this day, it's still like a, 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 a big secret. Um, and I, I think we would have made more progress if people better understood what Dr. King was trying to achieve in 65, 66, and 67, uh, because we still have a long way to go even today. In, in addition to the points that Zach made, another big issue is unfair appraisals, where uh, homes in Black neighborhoods are underappraised, sometimes by more than $100,000. And uh, uh, that can change and affect uh, the price of homes that uh, people of color are, are selling. Um, getting back just a little bit to the history, um, uh, I, I did photograph uh, Dr. King in uh, Chicago. And I photographed him because it seemed like no one else was telling the story. At that time, people were very critical, uh, especially people like Mayor Daley, was very critical of uh, Dr. King and put all the blame for the violence attached to the marches on Dr. King. So I tried to show photographically uh, that uh, it wasn't Dr. King at all. Uh, this is a photo of uh, Al Raby and Jesse Jackson uh, in, um, in Marquette Park in 1966. And uh, they were so important to the Chicago freedom movement that was going on at that time. And the next photo is uh, what I like about this photo that I took it's, uh, uh, again, um, uh, July 10, 1966. It's a, a crowd in Soldier Field. And they filled Soldier Field uh, to hear Dr. King. And as you can see from the photographs, it's just a, a healthy mix of white, black, and Latino. And uh, I, I, I love it for that reason, that it shows that uh, uh, in even in 1966, people in Chicago uh, were aware of their responsibilities to make change. And uh, this is one effort that they made. And this is uh, Mahalia Jackson, uh, again, in Soldier Field on July 10. She was one of the great supporters of uh, Dr. King and the Civil Rights Movement. James Bevel, uh, also uh, one of the leaders, especially of the Chicago Freedom Movement. And I first met him uh, in Selma, Alabama, when I went down in response to Dr. King's call for uh, the clergy to come down and stand up for voting rights. And Dr. King, uh, <clears throat> again, in uh, in Soldier Field, waving to all that attended. Another photograph of Dr. King in uh, Soldier Field. This is a photograph of uh, Dr. King and Al Raby in front of Chicago City Hall, uh, demanding uh, certain uh, changes uh, in the way city uh, the city of Chicago conducted itself in uh, protecting the rights of all people. And again, uh, this is uh, in front of uh, Chicago City Hall, uh, where Dr. King and others, uh, and I, I believe that's uh, Sid Finley right behind uh, Dr. King, uh, where they're again trying to emphasize the unfairness in the way that uh, people of color uh, were treated. And uh, Dr. King made so many inroads, but I, I don't think people fully appreciate what he did in Chicago uh, at that time. Again, uh, Dr. King and 
uh, El Ravi uh, in uh, Chicago in front of City Hall. Dr. King and Karata, this is on the march from Soldier Field to uh, Chicago City Hall. I was able to photograph, take this photograph. Uh, I got on top the roof of a funeral home. And uh, <coughs> the reason I like to show it now is it, it shows the, I think the, the, the discipline that was in the marches uh, led by Dr. King and L. Raby and other civil rights heroes uh, in, uh, that worked in uh, Chicago. Um, and uh, the police, uh, you can see the police presence. Uh, this is actually a day where the police were behaving themselves. Uh, that was not always the case, certainly not in uh, some of the marches that I was in. This is a, a black family just pulled into the gas station to get gas. They were not part of the march, but they just happened to be at a gas station about a, a half a block away from the march. And so these white punks were, you can see them throwing a can of oil, uh, a can, can of uh, empty Coke carton, and they already broke their uh, tail light and they were trying to tip the car off car over, uh, but the police came in in subsequent photos that I have. But again, it, here is just a, a family that came in to get gas, and this is the way they're treated in the Marquette neighborhood. It's, it's just such a, uh, a shame. And this is um, uh, men and women who uh, stood at the, uh, at the doors of a real estate office that discriminated against uh, uh, black families that were trying to, uh, uh, to move into uh, neighborhoods in uh, Chicago. This is a photo of Dr. King just after he was hit in the head uh, by a rock. Again, in, this is in Marquette Park. Thank you for that, Bernie, and thank you for for sharing that you know personal you know history as you were documenting this. And um, you know what I found interesting you know about the photography is that it's in color. And as we chatted, I, I think you had mentioned that these are you know these are one of the first color photos of Dr. Martin Luther King, and it possibly if the, the only ones. But um, uh, but I think that that's so important to help contextualize and help dimensionalize just uh, what was happening at that time. Um, and then as well as to mention him as an you know, individual. So, so thank you again for helping us to, to share that, that um, history and experience as you, as you were involved in the march. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I would love to turn it now back to the march and, and Ray and Claude, um, Ray, I know out of all of our panelists, you, um, you were there. And so would love to hear from you as someone who participated in, and I believe you were in junior high at the time, just, just what that was like as a participant in the march. So if you could share a little bit of your experiences sure. well, and. <laughs> well, I think the thing that, you know, again, uh, context is uh, growing up, my theory was, um, and this was the thing I think that is difficult to understand. I got the words recently to understand. What Wheaton did and what other areas did is they created black spaces. So what do you mean by black space? There were spaces where black people were supposed to be. And in Wheaton, that was the hill. And it was a much smaller area than Zach showed on the map, by the way. But Thank you. There was an apartment that was, a, it was a much smaller. I mean, we, you really, once you got to Hard Warden, you were done. I mean, you, there was no, now, there were some that people was on Liberty and stuff, but you know, Roosevelt Road, no, 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 no. You, I, I know because I would be on my bike and I would ride that way. And my folks were just about, you know, they're about to kill you. No, 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 don't go over there. Don't, 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 you, don't go over there. You can go down Prospect, but don't go all the way. It was the railroad tracks, just like it always is. It was the railroad tracks. We right. lived along the railroad tracks. You know, exactly. that was a, on the was other a, side of the railroad tracks. The, the other, other side. side. Right. Oh, we, that's oh, where yeah. the, that was the difference. 
because that was a negative in it. Now you you everybody wants to be on the railroad line yeah. for because of commuter trains, but that was yeah. a, that was a line of demarcation was the railroad tracks and not College Avenue. Because right. College Avenue was for Wheaton whites and college students. Right. Uh, Wheaton college students. You know. Yeah, and what's interesting, uh, just again talking about the neighborhood and what it meant is, you know, when they decided, hey, look, you know, in our white neighborhood on the other side of the tracks, there's some old houses that we want to kind of get rid of and kind of move. And you know, we don't want to move those into the good neighborhoods because they don't want houses that were already old and kind of beat up, you know. Well, you felt move those houses where? Yeah, across the tracks to that neighborhood, the other neighborhood. But the point of it is, is the reason why that's relevant is that is how real estate is how all the discrimination starts to take place, right? Because if you're not in the black space, if you're not in the black space, then everybody says, so what why are you out? What are you, what are you doing here, right? Why are you why are you here? One of the things that happened to us all the time, I mentioned before, is well, my dad would be in, in construction and you'd kind of, you know, drive, it'd be like, oh, wait a minute. We're, why are, why are you in this car, you know, with, why are you in this truck with boys in here with bikes in the back? Well, he said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Those are my boys' bikes. I just picked them up. They're helping me at the job site. But you'd be stopped because if you were on a job site that was out of the black community, well, see, you weren't where you're supposed to be. Because see, when you discriminate by housing, you can then determine where everybody who is black should be and shouldn't be. And it allows you to do policing to that effect. It allows you to do discrimination on almost everything. Your addresses, it's, it all falls in place. Literally discrimination, housing discrimination really is the key. Well, what's the relevance to that, to your question, Rachel? Well, that's what made me so scared to go to the march. <laughs> March wasn't in black space. And so for me to get in a group of people that, you know, was, was you know, and then go downtown with a sign, you know, uh, holding signs, saying things that I didn't think white people would necessarily like, I was terrified. And now remember, I have been looking at TV my whole life, you know, the little black and white, only three channels or so then, but I could see in the black and white that when police show up, Dogs show up, there's trouble. And remember, this hadn't been that long after what happened to King. And interestingly, you know, people talk about the North. King's own testimony was, hey, it was tough down South, but I didn't see nothing until I came to work. <laughs> the, the, the brutality and the aggression and the, and the repulsion was even stronger. And all of that was my context for the, the march. So I wasn't thinking of it as, as uh, and, and Mr. Audley was just, such an intellectual, uh, educated, well-spoken uh, man. But my, my dad was just, you know, kind of an old, old-fashioned kind of a guy. And I was like, Dad, I don't want to go to this. <laughs> I saw this on the movies. And if there's if there's a lot of police, you know, they're, they're going, well, as we walked along, I was thinking, this isn't so bad. It's not so bad. But then we got downtown. And what I remember is going down Front Street. And when I got uh, to the to the uh, front street and and saw, that's where I remember seeing police line. And I thought, oh my God, this is it. This is when it happens. And I literally remember thinking to myself, this must be it. I can't believe my, my dad made me come down here and just so we can all get eaten by these dogs and police down. So my experience was, is I didn't think of it as, you know, I, I hear people talk about it. I said, well, you know, we went here and they, there was a speech here. For me, it was fear. It was absolute dread of fear. And again, the reason why I took that long time talking about black space is because when you were in a large group of black people and you weren't in your black space, yeah, Claude knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. it wasn't, you want to be careful when you go across the tracks because you want to be in a big group because that was allowable. You're not where you're supposed to be. And so that was my experience at the march. Thank you. And, and Claude, I know uh, you share kind of the, the conversations. Uh, well, it first of all, my father had been through a number of marriages and experienced violence. And you have to remember, contextually, you saw what happened in Cicero. My father, I was a teenager at that time. And my father, at the last minute, decided I wasn't marching, which I was really upset because I had met a lot of people from the youth groups. 
there was some there's a few from the Wheaton, but there were like people like uh, one of the interesting people. Um, uh, gosh, I'm getting low. Uh, Fred Hampton. He was a member of the NAACP. He marched in Wheaton. People don't know that because Fred Hampton. He started out as an NAAC person. About three or four years later, he was gone into the Panther movement. But he was there. Uh, Father Grippy was there uh, from Milwaukee, who was an activist in Milwaukee. And uh, it was really kind of exciting to me. And uh, I was just really super disappointed that uh, uh, that uh, this did not happen. I didn't get that opportunity. What I can tell you, there were some in high school leading up to Mark, there was more snickering uh, from people about yeah, you know, these black folks coming downtown <laughs> acting up because I in, in at Wheaton Central and uh I just ignored it because you get all that subtle racism. There was never no overt racism in Wheaton, in my opinion, but there's all those little subtleties that over there, you know, because uh, there weren't enough of it. There's only eight or nine out of 350 people blacks <laughs> in the Wheaton High, so it didn't matter. But that's what I can remember is that it was exciting to me because of the, the organizing of it. And, you know, and, and my father always was explain the reason why we're doing it. And I do appreciate that. He was, you know, that why we had to do this and what this is important to, because that the ultimate goal was to legally permit to open up housing in Wheaton and eventually the suburbs, at least to the opportunity. You know, and uh, that and and going back to uh, Bernie, the re, uh, to Zach, <clears throat> while that was going on, Sid Finley and my father and other members of the NAACP, the reason that that little town in Weston opened up that ordinance is because uh, Mr. Finley and them were putting the pressure with the administration at, uh, for the time of commission, as well as excuse me, as uh, with uh, the national, the national um, uh, time of commission and locally. And that's why that, so that pressure was, was twofold. Finley was more involved in that than my father because that was his role as a, that's the role of, as a regional director in NAACP. So um, that's the what I can tell you with that. But it was an exciting time. And, uh, you know, that's what I can tell you. Great. Thank you for that. And, and, and would love to, uh, and that's a really interesting, I, I think, perspective, you know, both in terms of, you know, Ray, how, um, how, how much a lot of that fear was instilled of, you know, what, you know, what was happening, what was the reality of um, the situation that was going on and, and how that extended to that. And then as well as a perspective, you know, Claude, for, you know, your father's motivations for not, for you not participating and that um, with large it was, to, it was, it was just repercussions were going to happen. Yeah, that's what mm -hmm. it was. Definitely. Um, would love they to, were in Wheaton during the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'd love to also talk a little bit, about, you know, as one of Zach's, you know, overview had really shared, you know, obviously like the, uh, you know, moving now to, you know, this was about a year before the march happened. And then obviously there was events that happened between then and, and then the housing ordinance passing. And we'd love to spend a little bit of time of, about, you know, what happened after the ordinance passed, you know, which was about a year later after the march and, and what, you know, how, how was Wheaton at the, at the time? Did things change overnight? Would, you know, as residents living there, we'd love to hear that perspective on did things change or, you know, what did you see a change in the community? Uh, Go ahead, Ray. It's interesting. I, I saw in the chat someone was saying, you know, that the bottom used to be a bit of a garbage dump and that those houses were absolutely. Well, let me tell you about the hill. Uh, around 66 and so, my dad went and built our Glen Ellen house on a swamp. It was a swamp where Second Baptist Church is. That that whole thing, if you, if you if the swamp's still there, you can go look there. You just go behind Second Baptist Church, and you'll see it just gets really murky and kind of muddy. And it's, well, the truth was, there was a little hidden sidewalk that went down this street that wasn't a street then called Harward. It was totally wooded, totally. It was 
it was there was nothing there. There was it was not really you know it was part of Wheaton, but it wasn't unincorporated. But it wasn't wasn't anything. Nobody wanted to live there, and so uh, my dad uh, literally well, about this time had built another home there and had begun to build you know in the area, but always within the area that it was safe to build. And I remember Claude that. Um, uh, Homer uh, Branch moved into the right. uh, Branch family. And again, uh, these were educated, sophisticated Black folks who just weren't used to people telling them, no, you can't do that. <laughs> they were like, yeah, well, is this, you guys let this have kind of thing go on out here in Wheaton? And of course, that's what Claude, I kind of smile when you said there was no racism in, in Wheaton. Of course, that's what we learned because, you know, what you learn when you're in, uh, was it 3% or 1%? You just go along. You, if they could have, as long as they weren't hanging people in Burnley, we said, oh no, everything's just fine in Wheaton. Of course, uh, it wasn't at all. It was terrible. And uh, the, the, some of that is built into the fabric. Just a quick notion, just so I go all the way to the end, Rachel. So later, um, I had blown up a bit and I went back in uh, right around between 1995 and 2000. I can't get the exact year, I'll get it for you. And I went back to buy a new house that had been built right at the edge of Harwarden. So Harwarden Street dead end uh, into a T at that point, coming off Prospect. And they, they had built like three new homes next to the homes that were imported, uh, bad homes that were imported from Wheaton College, uh, building the Billy Graham Center and moving houses nobody else wanted into the black community. Oh, by the way, after the swamp and the dump, the reality, other reality is, is that uh, one of the things that you'll notice in a white neighborhood is you don't want to have next to you a place that has mentally disabled people or people that have had, you know, any kind of criminal background. Like that. Well, of course, where do you think the first place, by the way, I'm all for mentally uh, uh, disabled people. I have some of my relatives and family, that kind of thing. But everybody knows that one of the first things that housing does with its zoning is zone so that those places cannot be in certain areas. And again, in the black community, there are not one but two houses that had people that um, people would say were dangerous. Because remember, mental health back in the day was considered to be a place, you know, those were dangerous people, they were criminal people. And so uh, again, this was kind of what's that. But in 2000, I go in the, well, not around 2000, I go in the neighborhood to find out, and a realtor says to me, hey, look, you know, I'm talking on the phone and you can't tell, he couldn't tell from my voice, black people can. I, hey, you know, I want to buy this place. With, and he goes, I said, it's price pretty good. He goes, yeah, but he goes, but that's a, that's a bad neighborhood. I go, it's a bad neighborhood, really? Tell me, what, what's wrong? He goes, well, you know, I, I just, well, you know, it's just, you know, it's just, there were people, you know, literally, I wish I had a record, I'd play it for you right now. I just hit the button and you'd see that. So did things change, Rachel? Yeah, sort of, kind of, in the sense that, um, you know, I think Mr. Branch was one of the first uh, people to move out of the community. Uh, yes, Black people begin, eventually be, are able to move in other places. But the indication that I think, I appreciate Zach's earlier kind of point, because the message had been sent, really, truly, nah, y'all ain't welcome here. You can come once, you can come and, you know, you can be our pet Negroes, but you can't really come and have this community take on any of your identity. Because you see, as soon as you're walking down the street, our property values go down. And that's what's really important. So we're, we'll let you move some places as long as you stay, you know, stay spread out and we don't have to deal with it too much. But that really was the ethos. So did things change? I think, yeah, legally. And I think this is Rachel, part of the problem of why people are so upset with this idea of history and you know the critical race theory and that kind of thing, because what happens is when you explain the history and you kind of you can see the trend lines, and if you're in a position where you want to say those trend lines aren't still here, you don't really want to talk about that, and that's the key, you know. And 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 what's interesting is now that neighborhood is just like other neighborhoods has been gentrified, right? Because as, as Claude well said, bro, is it, yeah, those, those were ideal locations, just like Cabrini Green is <laughs> ideal location. And so once it was clear that, you know, wait a minute, wait a minute, we want those back. Then you look now in those houses, where are the black people and there are lots and lots of children who were a part of that? So answer, things did change. 
And the years later, no, you couldn't see it the years after. Uh, but over time, yeah, a little better. But did my dad ever get a lot and build one of his 17 houses outside of the black neighborhood? No. <laughs> And that that's that was really the case probably until the late seventies, early eighties. And now what had did happen, the only change I saw, uh blacks were able to move into apartment buildings along College Avenue and Roosevelt Road. And they were able and that was important in the sense that what limited job opportunities out there, there was affordable housing, you know. And and that's the only thing I can say. As far as the other housing practices, I don't, you know, it, you know, I, I really quit coming back and forth other than just to visit my parents after the 80s. So, uh, and I didn't see much of a change at that at that time, at least in Wheaton. But it did open up for the area, you know, as, as a migration of more we, uh, folks looking for housing outside of Chicago, you know. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. And um, and this was a question that it's come up in the Q&A and, you know, would just love, you know, all the panelists and the discussion on that, you know, especially since a lot of you have worked within fair housing, you know, have been part of the housing industry is more understanding where are we today and, you know, what still needs to happen. So, and I know that's a very, very big question, but we just love each of your perspectives on that. And, uh, and Bernie, I'll, if you, if you would mind, I'd love to start with you. Well, <clears throat> there are there certainly are plenty of laws in place, but it doesn't mean uh, that they're strong enough. It doesn't mean that uh, realtors and other uh, suppliers of housing are uh, following those laws. What, what's kind of interesting uh, over the years <clears throat> is that uh, while working at Hope, uh, in the, in, the, in the late 60s and 70s, uh, I thought mistakenly that the issues were simply black and white. But gradually we began to realize that there was discrimination against uh, uh, Latino men and women and families and uh, people with disabilities and other issues. Uh, uh, like those that were experienced by uh, black families, and uh, it's <clears throat> you know it's it's sad to hear the stories of the past, but really those stories can still be told today, new stories of people experiencing the same hate, the same discrimination, uh, in terms of of buying homes. Or, or just even driving while black, living in neighborhoods while black. Um, just one uh, quick uh, incident uh, in my own family. Uh, behind me, you might be able to see a picture of my nephew, Nathan. Well, he's now 17, but we were in, uh, uh, we were in Riverside and <clears throat> I don't know why, but he was tired, I guess, of listening to the old folks talk. So he went out to the car, sat in the car, had the light on, was eating um, uh, pie and ice cream. And all of a sudden, police cars came from uh, the east and from the west. And it just so happened that I and one of my uh, brother-in-laws uh, came out not unrelated to Nathan being there. But the police, you know, it's 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 fortunate that we were there. But why is it that we had to say, oh, it's okay, he was with us, meaning he was with white people, so he's he's safe. But here, um, yeah, it, and and those those kinds of incidents can be multiplied thousands of times around the country, and uh, and people are fed up. I think to answer your question, and this is just a plug uh, for Patrick and, and the NAACP, people have gotten complacent because they think, well, you did the rah-rah and you did the marches in the 60s and 70s, and now, you know, uh, 
uh, one of the things, one of the traps of the suburbs is that you can kind of hide from everybody. So you don't have to, you can go in your house and say, I don't have to deal with that. Well, the, the issue still exists. And what people have to do, they, they have to support and get involved in their advocacy groups, whether it's the NAACP, or whether it's a fair housing group, or whether it's the economic development. Economics is another big issue that, were, that came after the whole housing march. The, these things all tied together. And the problem is that people get complacent, blacks and whites, and they say, well, things have changed and therefore we don't have to do that. Well, it has changed to a degree, but it's nowhere where it should be in terms of eliminating racism and opportunity. Because all we're talking about is opportunity. That's what the NAACP is all about. That's why my father was a diehard member of it. Uh, that's why you have gentlemen like uh, Mr. Uh, Patrick and the other people. To, and also, you, know, you see, well, if you look at Ray's resume, the same down here in Cincinnati, you have to stay involved, you know, because he is, the trap, particularly in the suburbs, it's easy to get into the trap that, boy, it's rough being on the west side of Chicago. And thank God I'm not there on the south side of Chicago. But the same issues, just of a more subtle way, exist in DuPage County as it does in Wheaton, you know. And, but you got to, people have to continue to be involved and say, and don't become complacent. That's the only thing I can tell you right now. So that's, that's my only point. Well well said, both Bernie and Claude. I, I would say this, and this, Rachel, is why this is such a big deal. The problem is, is that uh, people want to use th these individualized emotional words that tie to individuals, words like discrimination, hate, bias, and those kinds of things. And then what happens is the person listening goes, well, I don't hate black people. I'm not even biased. And if I knew I wouldn't, if I am, I wouldn't know it. And then they'll also bring in the fact that, well, there's lots of people, you know, there's, and there are. But here's the net net. America has a racial caste system, a racial caste. And what that means is in a caste system, you have to put someone on the bottom. And in America, that's black people. And if you want to go all the way, it's black females. Or if you want to get more technical, probably black LGBTQI. But the reality is, there's a group of people there. And then there's groups that have similar uh, characteristics to them that are treated like them that are given certain privileges and not privileges if they'll cooperate with keeping the system in place. And so then brown people come in and back maybe when I was a kid, it wasn't so much brown people, maybe it was Catholics, maybe it was Jews, maybe it was um, maybe it was Irish people, maybe it was Italians, but many of those people became white because you see, if you will make the deal to continue to be part of the system without challenging it, then it works. You say, well, what's the point in this whole thing? Well, in Wheaton, what you have is there's not mean people uh, anymore as a percentage in Wheaton than anywhere else, probably maybe a smaller percentage because they don't have to. But but the reality is the system that's in place operates silently, easily, quickly, and so effectively that it can actually be fatal for a black person today. Uh, my uh, sons were uh, in the 2000s were arrested. One of my sons was arrested and attacked by a dog, a police dog in downtown Naperville. And the police dog ripped flesh off his body and was then uh, put into a Naperville uh, holding in the thing. And then the, the, the police then all uh, co-opted to say that uh, my son uh, resisted arrest. And then the tape finally showed he did nothing wrong. Uh, that actually he put his hands behind his back after he What's the point I'm trying to make? The point is, is that all you have to do is nothing. <laughs> and it just continues. People know in Wheaton, they still know the black spaces because what they've done in Wheaton is make pretty much 
all of DuPage County a white space. So when there's a black person, that person gets all the things you read about happen and no one has to do a thing. No one has to get angry. No one's, in, at Wheaton Central, Wheaton Community High School, my kids went there. The reality was is discrimination occurs because when you're in small groups constantly trying to adjust to what today they call microaggressions and macroaggressions, well, yeah, but all day long, you've got to realize that those people in that room say, hey, you're good as long as you're one of us, as long as you become one of us. And that, Rachel, goes against a lot of things. People say, well, you know, we want, to, want them to be a part of the community. But what they're really saying a lot of times is you've got to be a community according to our culture, according to our mores. And if we say there was no discrimination and there was no racism and Black people have it great in this country and they never should have kneeled at the national anthem, then you better not disagree with me because you know, you're not supposed to, this is our town, this is our community, this is our country. And that's what's in place in, in Wheaton. And that's why it continues to be a hostile environment uh, for black people to move in and begin to really uh, affect the culture. And the losers are all of us because this is not a black problem. This is a white people problem, to use the terms that we know. We, white people created race. There's no such thing we know as race. But when we lose the ability of Claude Audley's and his progeny to be wanting to move here and, and, and building up and coming back, and when, when generations of people don't look, Black people don't look at Wheaton as the place, when they do a school and call Wheaton South by changing the borders and put all the black people who used to go to Wheaton South, all of a sudden magically disappeared, just disappeared and went to Wheaton North, like kind of with other brown people and other people from low income areas. How did that happen? How did it happen that a school that used to have, you know, a much higher percent just now has like four or five of classes getting better. But these are the things that, that Wheaton uh, has to address. It's not about good, nice people like are on this call and on this video saying, well, I'm not disliking it. It's about tearing stuff down by being angry that Black people aren't moving in droves to this community and finding affordable housing, good opportunities, and finding that their culture is a culture that's welcome and that's actually celebrated and actually makes the whole community stronger and better. If nothing else, if you don't believe me, just, just do this one thing. You'll have a better football team, Wheaton. <laughs> if you can't, if you can't believe it anywhere else. Just believe it there. <laughs> thank you for, thank you for sharing that. And, um, and, and before we turn it over to, to the Q and A, because I do want to give a chance to the attendees to join. I want to thank you all again. Thank you, Ray and Claude, for sharing a little bit of history about your families. You know, they are been longtime residents, you know, really have helped contributed to making Wheaton what it is today in DuPage County. So thank you for sharing that, but also for your willingness and openness to be, you know, so candid and being able to share your personal experiences, you know, to helping tell, you know, the, this part of, of history about a moment that happened here in Wheaton. So, so thank you again. And thank you again to Bernie for, um, for taking the time and sharing a little bit of a lot of the work that you've done, you know, throughout Wheaton as well as the civil rights movement. So thank you all. And, um, and, and again, to Zach for, for giving us the historical context. Courtney, I'm gonna turn it over to you because I, I do know that there are a few questions in the Q&A that I wanna make sure that we, we get a chance to um, discuss. Um, our first question, so if anyone does have any, you can put them in the Q&A. Um, where are we now compared to where we were back when the March 1st happened in terms of equity and housing, which I think we kind of discussed. Um, and what are some of the solutions to addressing the ongoing problem, which I think Ray just got into. If anyone has anything else to add, please, please feel free. I just think you, you have to have advocacy. You have to be get involved in advocacy groups, such as the NAACP and other organizations. You know, it, it can't be, I mean, you, you, I can get on the corner and yell and scream, but that does nothing, you know. Uh, you have to organize and, and deal with issues there like that. I think the, and the other issue is, is really going to be around economic and education. And, and, and give a good example now, I'm, I'm an old guy now, but I just remember when I went to Wheaton Central, uh, Ray, he got maybe was better at Wheaton Glenbard West, but 
his cousin Vernon and I were in the same class. Vernon was brilliant. I mean, he was br mathematician out of the world. And my parents told me that I wasn't taking anything but college prep. They put Vernon in shop classes. And that's what they geared a lot of, the, especially the black males at that time. They were in, you know, and there's nothing wrong with shop because there's good skill development. But I'm talking about in terms of making people to their potential. They tried to do that to me. My mother just, who was the educator, <laughs> wasn't on playback, you know. And and um, so this, there's got to be, you have to stay on advocacy groups and you have to be an advocate. You can't just be quiet. It doesn't mean you have, maybe it doesn't have, you don't have to march and scream and yell, but there are ways that you have to advocate for a more fair opportunity to thrive and survive. That's my, my that's where I think it has to continue, you know. Uh, and it, 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 to change attitudes, you know. I think the big thing too is, if I could do anything is one of the things that, and read King's material, one of the things that kills and kill the civil rights movement uh, uh, and, and well, it didn't kill it, but it, it made it ineffective, uh, which is part of the, the theory of how did these good laws not get implemented? That's the theory of, of how we understand this. But the, the reason is, is that you have to believe the narratives that are out there. I have so many more stories. I had someone in the chat room said, "Well, I can't believe that happened to your to your sons." You know, I'm, I'm, you know, well, let's do some. That happens all the time to black people. That is not even special. <laughs> I remember when I was growing up, I, we went to Malloy's. Uh, we were at Malloy's, and and five squad cars come come up. They put a gun to my uh, behind me. I got in the back seat. I didn't know what I, what we had done. And the guy said, "Well, if you don't stop trying to talk, I'm going to put air conditioning in your head." I actually thought he meant turning up the air conditioning. Really, it was like years later that I realized what he was saying is, if you don't stop trying to talk, I'm going to shoot you in the head. <laughs> air conditioning, I thought it was just air conditioning. But the point of it is, don't, don't try to go into the, I'm happy to help people, but believe that this is normative for black people. And here's the key. You must, the place to start is for moderate people, people who think they're moderate, to believe it and allow it to soak in and really begin to make you say, this is bad for me. They are stealing my opportunities, my neighbors, my uh, academics. By the way, um, to Claude Ollie's point, my, my cousins who lived uh, at 1415 Avery in, in the basement with us there at the beginning, and then we moved to the house of Linnell and they took over that house. Um, Vern, just to, my, my take on the story, Vern went to University of Illinois. He was, as everything Claude said, and even more. And he went down there. And what he did is um, there was a group of people who were protesting that U of I had not uh, done the right things toward Black people. They didn't have a curriculum. There was discrimination going on. The same things that U of I now has Im implemented and made uh, you know, standard operating procedure. He was expelled because they took over a, a, a building. He was suspended and expelled, lost his deferment, went to Vietnam and was killed about six months after he got there. Literally my view, my brilliant cousin is dead today, not because he went to the, because he protested the treatment of black students at University of Illinois. And I've done the research, I can actually show you the sit-ins and things that were the part of the penalties. This is like normative. This is not special. <laughs> this is like, you know, these are the things that, and what we need is allies who will believe it and will not allow people to say, no, it's just a few people. No, I don't believe in systemic racism. No, you know, we got we can't have history that tells the truth <clears throat> about things that make people feel guilty about being white or black. We just need to all be no, we we need we need to love one another. That's the ultimate goal. But love starts with the truth. And it's 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 for all of us. And until people believe that we all have a stake 
in making this community better by ending the effects. And it won't end until people do what they did that day. And I did, I will end on a really good note what I'm gonna say is being on Roosevelt Road and seeing all those people, I just sat, held my sign and cried. I never thought in a thousand years I would see that many white folks hold the signs that they were holding. Oh my God, if only that could be the reality of our everyday experience, Wheaton would be a community that the whole world would be talking about. Enough said. One of the uh, problems, we have the laws, but and we have fair housing centers uh, all over the country, but they're very poorly funded. And to enforce fair housing laws, you have to conduct tests and investigations and all of that takes money and, and time. And, uh, and so little money goes into the fight for fair housing as opposed to uh, what goes into the military. And uh, as long as we treat uh, fair housing as kind of a stepchild uh, in, in our country, uh, we're going to make, we're not going to make much uh, progress. Uh, and, and, and housing is so important because where you live uh, determines the kind of schools that you can go to, uh, the kind of health care that you might receive, the open space and the parks that you can in enjoy, the job opportunities. So in, in my own instance, when I was growing up, I, I could work at the butcher shop, I could deliver newspapers. But uh, so many kids in so many neighborhoods don't have any opportunities uh, like that uh, in, in, as they grow up. And, um, and, and so it's, it's a loss, not only for them, it's a loss for all of us. Thank you all. Um, I wanted to give Patrick the opportunity to weigh in on that question as well. Um, or to give any information on how people can be involved in the uh, DuPage NAACP. And thank you for your comment in the chat as well. Um, please feel free to kind of reiterate on that. Absolutely, and, and thank you. And I have to say that this was an amazing panel and thank you all for providing this history. You know, growing up in the area, we didn't learn about black leaders in the area. We learned about things that happened in other places. <laughs> We're always made to feel isolated as though we were the first within the county. So it's great to hear about the things that happened and the accomplishments of the past and just the, the fight and the struggle. People can get involved with the NAACP through our website, uh, the DuPage County NAACP. Dot org. They can find out about a number of the various initiatives that uh, we have. Uh, we do lots of things. Housing is a big element for it. Obviously, I can't say it better than Bernie just mentioned is that if, when we look at systemic racism, housing is at its core. Outcomes are completely determined by housing, where you live, where you're educated, your health care, jobs that you have, your education, it's really all determined by housing. So that's one of the big areas that we focus on. We focus on a number of other elements of discrimination as well, from voting rights to women's rights to the environment. So if you're interested in making sure that everyone has fair access to success, I implore you to join us. Uh, we have meetings on the third Tuesday. It's actually right now our general meeting is going on. They're the third Tuesday of every month. So please, I ask you to join us. You can find out more information on our website and you can feel free also to contact me uh, to find out information as well about the branch. So much, Patrick. So thank you all for sticking with us. We went a little bit over time, but we really thought this, we felt this was very, very important um, to hear everyone's story. So thank you all for joining us. Huge thank you to Claude, Ray, and Bernie for sharing your stories. And a huge thank you to our partner organizations for making this possible, especially Rachel, who really brought us all together. So uh, yes, this is recorded. So I will uh, email out that link and it is also on the library. It'll be on the library's YouTube channel. So thank you all have a wonderful night.